Well, open your Bibles, if you would, tonight to Matthew, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, we've been talking and looking at the situation of these healings. There are four healings. The leopard, we find the centurion. Then as we go all the way down, we'll find out that Jesus goes to Peter's house after he went into the temple. Must have been fairly close to Peter's house. And he went in, and the, the family members, they asked Jesus. They beckoned him. They told him the situations. They, we could say that they stood in the gap for her, for Peter's mother-in-law, because she had a great fever. And we see how you and I can stand in the gap also for other people if we'll be willing to do that and speak the Word of God and the bread of life over them. And then all the way down to the fourth healing, we'll find we haven't got quite, quite got that far. But it talks about uh, in verse 16, and it says, And when the evening, Matthew 8, 16, And when the evening was come, they brought unto him many... Not just a few, but it says, many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and notice, and he healed all. Everybody say, he healed all. Everybody say, he healed all that were sick. And I want you to notice this, and use this scripture reference when you're talking to people about the goodness of God and the benefits, because healing is a benefit for you and I, that notice here the scripture says in Matthew 8, 16, that Jesus healed all. Notice he didn't screen anybody. If they were sick, they qualified. To get healed. Sometimes people think, well, God may heal this person, but he won't heal that person. Well, once again, we have to go back to the Scripture and let the Scripture be our opinion and our belief that Jesus healed them all. Everybody say, Jesus healed them all. But notice, go back, if you would, to Luke. Uh, actually, go back to Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah 58, because we found out that they're standing in the gap. And notice, God in Isaiah chapter 58 he declares and tells Israel about a fast, and it's scriptural to fast, but I think sometimes we somehow or ever think that our fasting is going to be such a shallow event or commitment that we think fasting is just, well, I'm just going to cut out a, a candy bar, and, and we're implying because you cut out a candy bar that God's going to move. Listen, God's not interested in your diet like you think he is. Uh, when it, Fasting means you're taking time to spend with God rather than you eating. The purpose of fasting is to get closer to God. Everybody say, the purpose of fasting, come on, everybody say, the purpose of fasting is to get closer to God. And of course, if you get closer to God, then you're listening, you're obeying, then how many know that? If you're listening, He's telling you, you're talking to Him, communication, then God will move. But see, sometimes we think, well, I'll just skip a meal today, and, and like God, God's going to do that. Well, listen, in the natural, I mean, the world skips meals all the time. You know, they call it special diets where I'm not going to eat at noon time. And so that's not why God moves. God moves because you get closer to Him. Remember, James says, draw nigh unto Him. Everybody say, draw nigh unto God. See, God is everywhere, and He's in us, but right on the other hand, that doesn't mean we're close to Him or fellowshipping with Him. But when we get close to God and fellowship with Him, that's when you begin to see Him moving, particularly when we're obedient. And if He tells us to do something, then we obey Him. But notice here in Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah chapter 58, God tells Israel to go on a fast because they're not doing the Word. Everybody say they're not doing the Word. And remember, in the New Testament, Jesus gave commissions to the church. He gave commissions in the Gospels toward the end of those writings, and He told the church then and still today, it hasn't changed, what the church is to do. And if you go back, and I shared with you last Wednesday, if you go back to the book of Acts, uh, Jesus talked about the Gospel. One of the things He said was, if you go to Matthew's account particularly, he said to go into all the world. Everybody said, go into all the world. And, but Israel, wasn't, Israel didn't go into all the world, the first eight or nine chapters. They just stayed in Jerusalem. See, this message is never to be contained just in your circle. It's supposed to be a worldwide message. Everybody deserves to hear the good news about salvation, the entire world. And so Israel was not being that light that God called them to be. So he told them about going on a fast. It's a little different fast. This fast was not one where they were going to stop doing something. This was a fast where they were going to have to do something. And notice, once they started obeying God and obedient and doing what they're called to do, everybody say, I too, and the body of Christ, we have a commission from God also to preach the Word, teach the Word, and lay hands on the sick. 
and saying, if we're not doing that as individuals, we're not walking in the light. We're not putting ourselves in the best position to be receiving from God because we're disobedient to Him. Now, we don't like to hear these things, but let's look at this example in Isaiah chapter 58 because this is what God is telling Israel. Remember, the reason that Israel, in, in the book of Revelation, the 70th week of Daniel, they're going to finally fulfill during a terrible time, the time of tribulation, they're going to actually step up and be the witness that God called them to be in the Old Testament. And God's telling the church today, you're to be a witness to the world today. You're to be the light. You're the salt. You're the light. If you're in the body of Christ, if you're a believer, Jesus, the head just isn't the salt, the light. The body is too. You don't see it being disconnected like the head's over here and the body's over here. If you see something like that happen in natural, what happens? Somebody's been decapitated. Well, that's not how the body of Christ works. The body of Christ is to do exactly what Jesus said to do. Jesus, the, he's the head, he's the salt, now we're the salt. Everybody say, I'm the salt to the world, I'm the light to the world. And remember, Jesus taught them in the Gospels that they are to let their light shine. That hasn't changed. People should know eventually, if you're going to be around people on a regular basis, eventually they should know that you're a child of God and what you stand for. But notice this fast was, you have to do what I've called you to do. And then he said, notice, he told them, he said, then your healing would spring forth. In other words, the reason that there weren't, the healings weren't coming forth was because they weren't doing anything. Say this with me, whatever I put my hand to, God will bless it. If I don't put my hand to anything, God has nothing to work with. And how many know we're to be obedient to do the Great Commission? The Great Commission is not, just not for the apostle, the pastor, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. No, it's for the entire believer. This is supposed to be a worldwide message. But notice this, this uh, fasting that God said to them. And this is a little different that you probably don't always hear when you talk about reading books about fasting. But this fasting was, hey, Israel, I called you to be a witness to the world. You're not doing it. That's why things aren't happening. You're not doing anything. Get obedient to me. And then within the context, he said, then your healing will come forth rapidly. But notice, he said, is not this the fast which I have chosen? He said, to loose the bands of the wicked, to undo the heavy burdens, and to, the, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Everybody say, break every yoke. This sounds a whole lot like Luke chapter 4, verse 18, doesn't it? When Jesus was anointed, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to do what? To set the captives free. Those people in bondages. Israel was called to do that. Jesus said he was called to do that. Are you ready for this, church? The body of Christ is called to do that. If you don't go, if you don't share, if you don't preach, if you don't let your light shine before people, then they won't have the opportunity to be, instead of being oppressed, they can be set free. Instead of being sick, they can be healed. Now, once again, you can't make people conform to the Word. But remember now, if you go back to Romans, the Bible says, how will they believe if they haven't heard? Well, how are they going to believe they can be set free and there's hope and help if we don't tell them? Look at yourself. Point to your mouth and say, my mouth is a mouthpiece for God to be used not only to sing praises to God and about God, but my mouth is to be used to preach the Word, share the Word, testify about the promises of God. And so here he said, they've not, they're not doing that. He said, it is not to deal thy bread, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, in other words, feed the poor, that thou should bring the poor that are cast into thy house. Jesus talked about in his ministry about giving coats. You know, if you've got two, give one. You see somebody in need. If you go back in Proverbs, Proverbs is full of scriptures talking about it gives us the good side and the bad side. It talks about the benefits of helping the poor when you see them. And right on the other hand, it talks about those people that turn a deaf ear to the poor. 
We still have the poor today. Everybody say, we sure do. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, you will always have the poor. The world is never going to get in this state, come to the place where the poor class would just be totally eliminated. Now, there's a lot of reasons we go into, but nevertheless, and there's always God moves on you to give them, to help them, do it. Well, how are they going to use it? Well, once again, if God tells you to do it, your responsibility is to obey God. Your responsibility is not to tell them how to spend it. Are you with me, church? When you give it out of obedience to God, unless the Lord tells you to do that. But anyhow, he said, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou should bring the poor that are cast out of thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Let then, notice, he says, when you start doing that, start being the witness, start going out helping humanity, start sharing the gospel, start preaching the gospel, start doing the things you're supposed to do. And it's the same for the church today. He said, then shall thy light bring forth as the morning. And thine health, everybody say thy health. Well, how many of you know, if your health is coming forward, what does that mean? Your healing, good health. And thy health shall spring forth, how church? Speedily, everybody say spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. In other words, the glory of God will even, even once you're gone, the glory of God and the presence of God will still stay there. But notice what happened. Now, go back, if you would, please, to James, the fifth chapter, James chapter 5. James chapter 5. The real reason you think about it, why healing has to be for the people of God, is because God wants his people to be healed and to be well so we can go out and preach the gospel, so we can go minister, so we can go serve all of humanity. Hard to do that when you're bed stricken. You can't go out into the highways and byways if you're in the bed. But you can if you're healed and well. Everybody say, I can if I'm healed and well. But remember, you know, God wants his people healed and well because we got a job to do. We have a responsibility. We have a commission from the head of the church, Jesus. But notice here in James, the fifth chapter, and the people will just start putting their hand to the plow. Start serving and getting out there and getting involved in their local church because the local church is always the hub of everything that God wants to have done. But notice here in James, the fifth chapter, when people will start putting their hand to the plow, you're giving God something to work with. But notice in James chapter 5, James chapter 5, James chapter 5, and notice, let's go to verse 13. James chapter 5, verse 13. James chapter 5, verse 13. James chapter 5, verse 13. Notice what the writer of James says, the Holy Ghost through James said to the believers. And if you go back to the beginning, keep your finger there and go back to the beginning. You'll find out that many of these were Jews that were scattered abroad. They left Jerusalem because of the persecution. I'm thoroughly convinced if they would have went to the highways and byways at the beginning of their ministry and not stayed in Jerusalem, they may not have been persecuted. You say, well, did God do the persecution? No, God didn't do the persecution. But once again, when God tells you to do something and you don't do it, you don't stay in the light. Everybody got that? By your act of obedience, your disobedience to the word, you're in darkness. And if you're in darkness, how many of you know the devil's in there and all of his workers? And they're not coming there to bring your life an easy life. They're coming to make your life miserable. That's why you want to stay in the light, but you can't be disobedient and think you're still staying in the light. Well, I mean, I don't do everything right. You're supposed to walk in the light that you have. If you know what the Bible says to do, then you have to do it. Everybody say, I need to do it. Or you're in darkness, and if you're in darkness, you are open target for the enemy. Well, how come God don't protect me? Well, how come you're not obeying him? Should be the real question. If you obey God... God will do his part in protecting you. But if you don't, you by your own act of disobedience are over in some, another person's territory. You're open game. Now, the good news is if you realize you're not obeying God, go back, repent quickly, and start doing what God told you to do. 
I remember hearing a minister say years gone by, he was talking, it was a seminar on prayers, and he said, you know, if I find my prayers aren't all of a sudden getting answered, he said, one of the first areas that I look at is, did God tell me to do something about that same time that my answers are not being, my prayers are not being answered that I haven't done? And he said, lots of times, if you're having success and you know how to pray and get your prayers for you specifically done, and all of a sudden they're not being answered, the first thing you've got to do is go back and find out, did God tell me to do something that I'm not doing, and now it's hindering me from receiving from him? Now, we like the benefits, but the benefits come by walking in the light. Walking in the light means I'm walking in obedience. Are you at James, the fifth chapter? Is any among you afflicted? Once again, he's talking to believers here now. And the word afflicted has nothing to do with sickness and disease. The word afflicted here means that you're having a hard time. Test and trials. Everybody say a hard time. Anybody ever have a hard time? Anybody ever have one of those days where it seemed like everything that you got involved in went haywire, went wrong, I mean, it was just like you're going from one fire to the other. Anybody ever been like that? You know, Paul said over in 1 Corinthians, he said he was talking about a situation, and he said we were pressed beyond measure. In other words, he said, man, we got pressure on us from all sides. He said if we go this way, there's pressure. If we go that way, there's pressure. If we go this way, there's pressure. If we go that way, it's pressure. And he said above all that, he said death threats around us everywhere. And he said no matter which way we go, we feel like we're going to die. But he also said something over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 about it. He said, but I learned not to put my trust in me. See, when we're in being pressed on, what am I going to do? When, when things get rough, don't go our way, what are we going to do? See, the enemy likes to put pressure on everybody in this room. He wants to squeeze you. He wants to, how, how many of you ever made lemonade before? where you take real lemons and squash them and then you press them down. See, the enemy wants to do that to you. He wants to apply pressure to you to find out if you'll run to God or if you'll run away from God. I hate to say this, but down is my observation. A lot of people, when it gets rough, they should run to God. Because, see, if you run to God, then he'll deliver you. But what happens when pressure applies? They run away from God. Now, now are you not only having the pressure applied to you, but not from God, but now the enemy, because you're making a decision and your mouth. Well, you can really tell a lot about where you're at in God by your mouth. Listen to how you talk. Because remember, James says, my tongue. Everybody say it. My tongue is the rudder or the bridle to my body. In other words, it's giving me direction in what I'm going to do. Don't have to worry about judging other people. Just listen to you. If doubt, fear, confusion, unbelief starts coming out of your mouth, you better run back to God in a hurry and repent. Everybody say, run back to God and repent. But notice what he said here to do when you feel like you're being pressed on all sides, when you feel like, man, it just seems like everything's going haywire. Notice what he said to do. He said, is any among you afflicted? Next three words, what is it, church? What are we to do when we're having one of those days where we feel like we're pressed in? Huh? Everybody say, run to God. Come on, everybody say, run to God. Isn't that what prayer is? We're running to God. He already knows about it, but he can't get involved. See, God is all-knowing, but somehow or ever down through the ages, somehow or ever the church has got the idea because God is all-knowing, that that automatically gives him permission to be involved, and it doesn't. He's all-knowing. He knows that he's waiting. Say it with me. God is waiting. God is watching. And God is listening to find out what I want him to do. Remember, whatever you bind on what church? Earth will be what? Bound in what? Heaven. So will heaven be? Back you up if you bind things on earth. The word binding can be stopped. Right on the other hand, he also said, whatever you loose or allow on earth, whatever you loose or allow on earth, heaven will back you up. You know God will actually allow you to do something that's out of his will because you want to do it 
And he, by his own will, will let you do it. Because, see, he's not a dictator. God is not a spiritual bully. Everybody got that? Sometimes we wish he was. Sometimes we wish he was with people, but he's not. Why? Because he loves us. He wants his kids to come to us because we love him and we know that. And he loves us. Isn't it a whole lot better going to the Father because he didn't make you? Well, I got to go to church because, you know, they, they make me go to church. Well, what about if you go to church because you want to go to church? I mean, I think you're going to learn something better. Trust me, I went a lot of days to public school. I didn't want to go there. And, I mean, I was there physically, but mentally, half the time, I mean, I was checked out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't raise your hand. I mean, I was like there, but I wasn't there. And, of course, sometimes when it came for the test time, it showed up. I was there in body, but I wasn't there mentally speaking. But he said, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Everybody say, when I'm having a bad day. Come on, look at your neighbor and go, when you're having a bad day. Point yourself and say, when I'm having a bad day, I'm to pray. Look at your neighbor, I'm to pray. Notice it doesn't say for the believer, call up a bunch of people and have them pray for you. Everybody see that. If you don't learn how to pray for yourself, you will never know if God moved on your behalf or because of the people that prayed for you behalf. It's a great day for the child of God as far as maturity-wise when you really wake up and begin to go, you know what, I can get a hold of God any place, any time, anywhere. I know how to pray. You don't have to wait to church. You don't have to try to get some other brother or sister. But until you get there, it's okay to lean on somebody. But God wants us to have a communication with Him. You have to learn to develop that relationship. And you'll never grow in prayer if you don't do the praying for yourself. You have to get it done. Everybody say, i got to get it done. Now notice, so if I'm having a bad day, what, what, what's the Word of God tell believers to do? Come on, read it. Verse 13, is any among you afflicted? It means hard, hard times, suffering, test trial. If you're having one of those rough days, what does the Bible tell you as a believer to do? Come on, everybody say, I am to pray. Say it out loud. I am to pray. Oh, it's a whole lot better talking to God than to complain. All right. So the next time somebody tells you and they start squabbling about some different things, just say, hey, you're a Christian, right? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, instead of you complaining about it, why don't you go to God and let him do something about it? Because, see, complaints doesn't move God. Actually, if you go back to Acts, or not in Acts, Numbers 14, Acts, Numbers 13, Numbers 14, Numbers 15, Israel was murmuring and complaining, and the Bible says God doesn't like it. You know why he doesn't like it? Because all you're doing is talking about the problem. You're not going to the one that can resolve the problem. You're not going to him. Our human nature, our flesh nature just likes to talk about it. See, you can talk about the problem or you can get it resolved. I think sometimes people just want to complain. Everybody, get, everybody say, that's not going to be me. All right, so notice, is any merry? The word merry here means cheerful, happy, or feeling good. Anybody have one of those days like that? It's just happy, cheerful, or good? I remember watching Walt Disney, Jiminy Cricket, come on. He'd sing zippity doo da, zippity day. Now, I was a... I was a young kid, and man, he sang, I thought, whoo, man, I like that. That makes me feel good. Well, when you've got one of them days going on, you're thinking, glory to God. What are we supposed to do? Notice here, let him do what, church? Come on, everybody say, let him sing. Look at your name and go, when I'm happy, I'm to be singing. And the Bible says sing psalms. See, God will give you spiritual psalms if you're happy. Matter of fact, if you're happy, and you want to stay happy, keep on singing. Everybody say, I'm happy. I want to stay happy. I'm going to keep on singing. Now, I prove it to you in the Scripture. The Bible says, uh, putting on a merry heart. A merry heart is good like what? What's a merry heart like? Medicine. Everybody say, like medicine. So if I'm having a bad day, start singing. Start shouting. Start praising God. All right, let's read on. These are for the believers. Well, Pastor, I don't much like any of these answers. Well, you can complain. You can get on Facebook and put your text out there and vent, but nothing's going to happen. 
He says, is any married? Let him sing psalms. Verse 14, this is how we know that affliction has nothing to do with sickness and disease. But here, verse 14 does talk about sickness and disease. And notice he's talking about there's no screening process about I'm going to heal just the men today or I'm going to heal just the women today or I'm going to heal just the young today or I'm going to heal just the people with leg problems. No, notice what he said in verse 14. And this is written to the believers because this is an epistle. And by the way, this is talking about a church service. Is any sick among you? Everybody say any. Notice anybody is what? There's no screening process. There's nothing there that would denote, you know, God healing some or maybe healing this person and not pastor. No. Notice it said, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him. Anointing. Everybody say anointing. Now Isaiah talks about the anointing and he says it's the anointing is what? It's the power of God. Everybody say the anointing is the power of God. Now notice, he said anointing them with oil. What does that have to do with the power of God? Well, because God literally is wanting you to do a physical act as a spiritual event that will happen if you obey his word. So he's literally, you know, so, well, I just wish I had a sign. All right, just think about this. Here God's saying, all right, here's your sign. Those elders are going to pray for you, and they're going to pray the prayer of faith because they believe that God wants you to be healed and well. We're going to pray oil over you. Oil is something you can see, you can feel, and you can touch. And when they pour it on you, that's going to be the equivalency of, of my power coming on you. You're going to be able to, listen church, you're going to be able to feel it. Everybody say, I'm going to be able to feel it. But see, you still have to make the conversion of faith and believing that that is not just oil up there, but it's the anointing. Everybody say, it's the anointing. It's like taking communion. You can take communion just out of a religious service or when you take that bread, you can say, Father, I receive this bread as the broken body of Jesus, and I take healing into my body. See, you still got to mix faith with it. And he said, for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of who? Everybody say, in the name of the Lord or in the name of Jesus. Now notice verse 15. And the prayer of I hope so. Or the pray if it be thy will. Or the prayer of let's see. No, the prayer of faith. Everybody say the prayer of faith. That's why it tickles me when people, they get mad at people. Oh, you're just one of them faith preachers. Yeah, I am. Thank you very much. And you should take that as a badge of uh, a compliment. Now, people say that sarcastically, but listen, faith is how you're going to get the victory. Anybody like the victory? How many of you have the shield of faith with you tonight? Anybody have the shield of faith with you tonight? Okay, three of us. How about the rest of you? I hope you're not spiritually naked in there. Glory to God. Everybody say, thank you, Lord. I have the shield of faith. I'm holding it up by faith. Thank you, Lord. Anytime the enemy shoots at me, the shield of faith, puts out every attack that the enemy shoots at me. How often? Every time. So people don't like talking about faith and stuff. Well, you will when you're getting shot at. But if you don't like it, then get prepared to get hit. Because if you don't hold that shield of faith up, you're in trouble. Everybody say, I'm going to hold the shield of faith up. But here he said, the prayer of faith, the prayer of faith. What kind of prayer? Come on, what kind of prayer? See, there's lots of different prayers, but this is the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith, or we could say the prayer of knowing, right, or believing. The prayer of faith shall save. Now, if you look the word up, it's interesting, because here he uses the word save, implying like salvation. But actually, if you look the word up save in the Greek, it means to heal and deliver. See, salvation's a bunch of things besides your sins being omitted. He said, shall save or heal the sick, and the Lord shall. Everybody say, shall. Now, notice two times, three times in this verse, the word shall. 
That means you can count on it. First it says the prayer of faith shall save. Here it says the Lord shall raise him up. Of course, how many of you know healed people get up? Everybody say healed people get up. And if he hath committed sins, even if their sin is the problem, they shall be what, church? They shall be forgiven. Everybody say they shall be forgiven. So you see here you can stand in the gap and get involved for other people. Now notice, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul's writing to the church. And if you go back and you study the, the, book, the book of Corinthians, you know that 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul had to call out individuals in the church that were committing fornication. And remember, fornication is a work of the flesh. How many of you know that? Galatians tells us fornication, everybody say fornication, is a work of the flesh. And it also tells us in Galatians that those that do those works of the flesh and, and of the likewise, in other words, he doesn't list all the works of the flesh, but the things that kind of go hand in hand with them, he said they could put themselves in jeopardy to what? Lose their salvation. Everybody say lose their salvation. Now, see, this is things people don't like to hear because some people think once saved, always saved. Well, I think that in one sense of the word because I don't want out and I'm not getting out. I don't want to live like Samson did, be anointed by God. God never called Samson to have a relationship with Delilah. Actually, God told the people of Israel that they were to not have a relationship outside of the people of Israel. Delilah wasn't an Israelite. She was a known enemy. But Samson thought, because he had this great power and the power of God came on him, that he played games with it. It cost him the anointing for a while. You don't want to get to that place. But notice, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, notice what Paul is telling them about after he talks and deals with the subject of fornication. And he actually said, I delivered one unto Satan. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, he turned the young man that was committing the act of fornication over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Everybody say destruction of the flesh. In other words, what Paul said, I judged it. If they don't want to repent, how many know you're open game for the enemy? He said, I turned him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And it goes on to say, so that his soul might be saved. In other words, you come to the place where you continue doing it. You turn your heart away from God. And now you went from being in the kingdom to being out of the kingdom. It's better to die prematurely. Come on, church. And be in heaven forever than to live another 25 years and lose your salvation and be in hell eternally. I remember a young man gave his life to the Lord, lived a pretty wild life. And about two weeks after he got saved, uh, actually I had, a, I had a family member like that. Um, never had an interest in God. Never had an interest in going to church. He wasn't an atheist. He just wasn't interested, like a lot of people. The problem with that kind of thinking is sooner or later you're going to meet up and be on Judgment Day. And you don't know when. When you're living on the outside, you're not being protected. The enemy, he can take you out in a hurry. Well, this individual family member was in his 40s, and we became very close. He was, he was my uncle, and I remember talking to him. And I led him to the Lord when he was in the hospital with cancer. And they brought him home. Many times they do that on hospice. And I believe in God for his healing, and he's not getting connected to that. And I remember praying once again and thanking God. And as I was praying and thanking God for his healing, now I could have just forced myself, but every time I tried to have the words come out for a healing, it was like somebody put a stop on my mouth. And that happened a couple of times. I'm like, what in the world is going on? And finally, I said, Lord, what's going on? And the Lord said, let him go. He's in the best spiritual condition he has ever been his entire life. It's better for you to let him. Now, listen, he said, it's better for you to let him go so he's with me. Well, a couple of days later, I let him go. I'd rather my uncle be in heaven eternally. Come on, church then spend another 20 years down here and not make it to heaven. After all, 
20, another 20, 30 years down the road, there's going to be nothing compared to eternity. Everybody say eternity. So he's with Jesus now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But now notice. Notice here what Paul said to the church at Corinth, and he's saying to you and I, and it's still the same day. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, he said flee fornication. So apparently there must have been fornication going on in the church, of the Corinthian church. Can you imagine the service that had the gifts of the Spirit in operation and then they go out and operate in the flesh? How I many know that's not the way God wants you to operate? If you can yield to the power of God in a service, you can yield to the power of God out of church. You ever hear anybody come up to you and go, well, you know, they, they put a great show on for people when they're around, but man, when people are not around, you know, they get depressed and they get, well, listen, if you can do it in front of people, then you can do it anytime. That means you're in control. You can do it if you want to. But you have to be disciplined enough to be consistent. But notice here, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, if you have it, say, I got it. Notice what Paul's telling them after he said about flee fornication. And he said, fornication sinneth against his own body. He said, what? In other words, you don't know this or remember this? He said, what? Know ye not that your body, whose body? Everybody say, my body. In other words, he's like, you should be knowing this. What? Know ye not that your body, everybody say it, my body, is the temple of the what? What is your body? Come on, what is your body? God said your body is what? The temple of the Holy Ghost. In other words, your body is is housing. That's what a temple is. It's a house, a home, a building. Your body is housing the Holy Spirit. How far is God from you? Not very far. About 18 inches from my mouth. He's in there. Everybody say, God's in there. Come on, everybody say, God's in me. Say it again. God is in me. Let's read it again. What? Don't you know? Oh, a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians don't know it, or if they knew it, they forgot it. They wouldn't be doing things in their bodies if they realized the Holy Ghost is in there. See, they think they got away with it, but you didn't get away with it. Holy Ghost, you, you did it right in front of the Holy Ghost. He said, every, verse 18, verse 19, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Who's in you? Come on, everybody say, Holy Ghost is in me. Say it again. Holy Ghost is in me. Who's in you? The Holy, who's in you? Everybody say it. The Holy Spirit of God Almighty is in me. Where's he at, church? He's in me. When you leave, who goes with you? Huh? Huh? When you get in your car and sit down and close the door and turn the key over, where's the Holy Ghost? Come on, everybody say, he's in me. When you're driving down the road, who's going down the road with you? Holy Ghost, right? Well, we need him around here, don't we, with the deer and the bear, stuff popping out all the time, right? If we'll listen, he's in there. See, the Old Testament people couldn't say that. The Old Testament, they weren't born again. The Holy Ghost couldn't come in them. Why? You can't put new wine in old wineskins. That's referring to the Spirit of God and your spirit. Your spirit under the Old Testament wasn't born again. He called it old wineskin. Now you and I got born again, we can have the Holy Ghost come in us. He goes on to tell us, he said, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Who's in you right now? Come on, who's in you right now? Stand up and tell five people. Put your Bible down and say, the Holy Ghost is in me. Tell five people real quickly. Go tell five people, the Holy Ghost is in me. Glory to God. Say it like you believe it. Oh, the Holy Ghost is in me. You haven't got the revelation of it. Or you don't believe the Word. Who's in you? Now, when you go to bed tonight, when you set your alarm or whatever you do, when you go to bed tonight, who is in you? When you rise up tomorrow morning and your body and your eyes don't want to get up, don't want to get motivated, who is in you? The Holy Ghost. 
when you start about to say some things come out of your mouth that you should not be saying, you, if you'll start to listen to your spirit down here, the Holy Ghost will tell you, you shouldn't be saying that because that's not true. Most Christians really don't know this or don't believe this because if they did, they would stop all their whining, complaining, and fussing and just going on and on and on if they just realized God is in me. The Spirit of God is in me. He's in me all the time. Oh, we just need to pray. We just need God move. No, it's probably you that needs to move. You've got to get active. You can't speak things contrary to what God says about you and then think God's going to move. It doesn't operate that way. God moves according to His Word. Say that with me. God moves according to His Word. Let's read on. He said, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God. Uh Uh-oh, here we go again. So who's in me? Who's in you? Every believer, right? Oh, boy, here we go. And who's the Holy Ghost from? Who's the Holy Ghost from? It's from God. Now, I'm, one of the reasons that I'm sure that he said that is because I've had people tell me after I got filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues that they told me that that was of the devil. Now, that's funny. When I was serving the devil, I never did it. Now I'm serving God, get filled with the Holy Ghost. Now I'm of the devil. No, you're confused. And notice, it says right here that the Holy Ghost I have is from who? From God. Notice one of the teachings, I believe, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus talked about that. He said, you, if you ask God to give you the Holy Ghost, he's not going to give you a scorpion. Now, if you know anything about Jesus' teaching, he likened Satan and the demonic forces as snakes and scorpions and serpents. See, the Holy Ghost is from God. The Holy Spirit has been given to you and I. Then there's the baptism, where He wants us to be filled with the Spirit. One thing to be born of the Spirit, it's another thing to be filled with the Spirit. He goes on to tell us, He said, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Say it again, Holy Ghost is in me. Come on, say it again, Holy Ghost is in me. You know, if you want to start hearing the voice of, uh, the, voice of the Good Shepherd, if you want to start hearing the Holy Ghost, not, not with your mental, because he's not up in your mind, he's down in your spirit. You need to start listening down here. It's not audible, it's like an unction. It's a leading, a prompting, a knowing. Start going around saying, thank you, Lord, Holy Ghost is in me. Holy Ghost is in me. Now, a lot of times you're not going to feel it. You're not going to feel like it. But this is where I can go back, Buck, to what God said, and I'll walk by faith, not by sight, not to how I feel, Not go by the situations, oh, I know God's here because, man, the hair on the back of my head's standing up. I got news for you. God was here before your hair stood up. Don't ever let a physical manifestation be the confirmation of what God already said about it. Because, see, God's already here. I said God's already here, and he's in you. And if he wasn't here when you came, he was here. Say it again, Holy Ghost in me. Come on, everybody say, Holy Ghost is in me. Point to some and say, the same Holy Ghost that was in Jesus is in me. Go back and read Romans chapter 8. It tells us that. Now notice. Let's get on here. He said, which is in you, which ye have of God or from God, and well, there's a lot of good things in verse 19. Remember, he's talking to carnal, carnal Christians. A lot of carnal Christians need to know this. And he said, And ye are not your own. Who's my boss? Who's your boss? Huh? Who are you led by? Now, when it says you are not your own, that doesn't mean God takes away the ability and the freedom for you to choose what you want. But if he's Lord of you, then you should be listening to him and not you. Jeremiah, I believe Jeremiah chapter 17, write it down, Jeremiah chapter 17. You can look the cross reference up. It says, cursed is he who puts his trust in man. A couple of verses after that, it says, blessed is the man who puts his trust in God. (laughs) 
God's got a way better plan than you and I do. If, if you've got it figured out, it's probably not the plan of God. It's probably just another humanistic plan. But he said, you are not your own. Who's in charge of you? You have to ask yourself the question, because notice he's got a question mark. How many of you have a question mark at the end of verse 19? He's saying, you are not your own. In other words, don't you, don't you know that you are not your own? Say it with me, Jesus. Come on, say it loudly. Jesus is my Lord. Come on, say it again. Jesus is my Lord. Point to somebody and say, Jesus is my master every day, every hour, every minute, every second. Who's your master? Huh? Jesus or the Father of the Holy Ghost? Absolutely. And it's no wonder he, he told him, the Holy Ghost said to Paul to tell him in verse 19, the Holy Ghost in you. See, if we start getting conscious of him being in us, it's amazing how our conversational talk change. He said, you are not your own. Everybody say, I'm not my own. Say it with me again. God is in charge. God is leading my life. Now, if you choose to rebel, he'll let you rebel. But then don't say he's in charge when he's not. If you've got the reins of your life and you're not choosing to do what he says to do, it's your baby. But be ready for the results you bring. Verse 20. He said, for you are bought with a price. So see, you were bought. And you were bought and you were accepted by Jesus out of your own free will. It wasn't a slave thing like you didn't have any choice. The invitation came out. The call came out to accept Christ, to make him the Lord of your life. You, by your own free will and choice, said, I accept him as Lord and master of my life. What did I in turn do? I'm saying to him, I'm giving you my life, and I'm turning the reins of my life over to you, and now whatever you tell me to do, that's what I'm going to do. You remember Jesus' ministry? He said, I only do. I don't add to, don't take away. I only do what I see my father do. I only do what I hear him tell me to say. Oh, that's a lesson for all of us, isn't it? Sometimes you just, when you set it up, set it up. Let's read on. You are bought with a price. Have you been bought? You've been bought. That means you were of value. He said, and because you've been bought with a price, of course, the price, the person that paid, that's Jesus. He said, Therefore, because you've been bought with a price and you're not your own, therefore glorify God. Everybody say glorify God. Come on, let me say glorify God. Should Christians be glorifying God or magnifying God? Should we be giving glory to God? Absolutely. Therefore, you are bought with a price. You've been a bought price. Therefore, because of that, glorify God in your body. And in your what church? Spirit, which are whose? So did God buy my body? Huh? Let's read that again. But you're bought with a price. Now we know that we are a three part being, aren't we? Say it with me. I'm a three part being. What am I, first of all? What am I, first of all, but? Say it with me. I am a spirit. Looked at him and go, I am a spirit. Number two, I have a soul. The soul is what? Point up here to your temple. It's my mind, my will, and what? My emotions. Don't say you can't control your emotions. You can. Get your thoughts lined up with the Word, and you can control your emotions. Well, I'm a woman. Doesn't matter. Well, I'm, 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 I'm redheaded, and I got a, man, I'm just born with an attitude. Get your mind renewed. Notice there's nobody that gets exempt from this. Everybody can do it. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Notice it doesn't say, and I live in a body, but notice it doesn't bring up the soul. But it does tell us here that God bought my body. Does everybody see that? Verse 20. Everybody got verse 20. God bought my body, and he said, Glorify God in your body. See, you're the one that has to do the glorifying. 
in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Say it with me. God bought my spirit and he bought my body. I know God wants my spirit to be strong, to be holy, to be righteous, to grow, to be mature, but he also bought my body, so he must want my body to be healed because healing glorifies God. Sickness and disease does not glorify God. Well, let's close our Bibles. Glory to God. Let's stand up in our bodies, not only on the outside, but also on the inside. Let's stand up and let's lift our hands. Hallelujah. We're going to glorify God and let's just thank Him and let's just begin to praise Him for healing is for us because God already bought our body. And anytime God buys something, He makes all kinds of provision so that things are healed and whole. Father, say this with me. Say, thank you, Lord. I realize I've been bought with a price. You love me. You paid for my spiritual condition. I was lost. I was in darkness. I was in sin. I was spiritually dead, separated from you. But through your plan that your son walked out, lived out, and bought for me, now I'm spiritually alive unto you today as a son and a daughter. Thank you, Lord. I'm spiritually alive unto you. Thank you, Lord. You bought my body. I realize, according to the Word of God, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, by Jesus' stripes, I was healed. Jesus, your plan, the stripes on His back, you bought, you purchased, you paid so that I could be free from all sickness, all disease, all abnormalities. Thank you, Lord, for healing my body. I receive it right now by faith. I'm going to use my body to glorify you. And thank you, Lord, that you are my healer. You are my deliverer. You are my provider. Thank you, Lord. I have been redeemed from the curse of the law. I am not cursed, but I have been blessed, and the blessings are from you, the blessings of God. Thank you, Father. I give you all the praise, all the glory, I'm going to continue to grow spiritually. I'm going to continue to walk in health and healing. It's my benefits. You paid the price. I accept them. I receive them by faith, and I thank you for them. In Jesus' name, everybody shout amen. Amen. Turn around and tell somebody, don't forget the Holy Ghost. He is in you all the time. See you Sunday morning.